ability score improvement, or feat, and why? I have said this multiple times, and I have made no excuses for it. Although I am in my late 20s, I started with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition when I was in college when I was 16. Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition had nothing like feats, but it did have ways of improving your ability scores up to a maximum of 18, unless it's strength, in which case it goes to 18 0, 0 meaning 100. Long and complicated, I'm not getting into it. In short, why would you pick ability score improvements over feats? I get there's a lot of them, and I get that many of them are confusing and can change gameplay, but that's what's fun! That's the customization of the character! On top of that, most feats give you a one-point ability score improvement. If you're lacking in an ability, look for a feat that boosts that ability. It's not that hard. And then you're going to be doing something interesting that is giving to the table, giving to the story. I could go on about this forever. Feats are better. Well, okay then. Honestly, not trying to make fun at the comment. It's just an argument I've heard a lot when it comes down to feats versus ASI in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. And it sets up for TTRPG advice. Number 19, dealing with broken characters or broken tables. Now, I'll get to the actual advice in a moment, but I am going to preface this by saying, personally, I don't actually believe there is such a thing as a broken character or a broken game. See, in video games, the term broken means that overpowered, janky, not functioning. TTRPGs exist exclusively in our mind and are at the behest of the dungeon master or the games master. You can't build a broken character if the Games Master and Dungeon Master doesn't want you to, or if they have the adaptability and capacity to work around your broken build. This is kind of why I'm not keen on a lot of TTRPG content on here where it talks about, in D&D 5th edition you can turn into an ancient gold dragon. Let's build a character with armor class a million. And similar concepts, because to actually run those in a game, you're relying on the Dungeon Master giving you certain equipment, certain abilities, and having certain roles. So saying feats can make a bro character broken? While that is true, it's down to the Dungeon Master to stop that becoming broken. Now how to deal with someone if they have built a broken character. Now for Games Masters and tabletop players, the advice is the same. Talk to them. If someone goes into a game objectionally trying to build a broken character, or attempting to break the campaign, that is a toxic trait. That is not a trait you need at the table, and that is not a table that you should be playing at. Or at the very least, they shouldn't be playing with you. The TTRPGs are, at the end of the day, group building experiences. Activities that, let's face it, if a corporate organization was able to bottle what we do in these games, they would be no trust fall exercises, because you trust in Gavin in accounting to heal you. So broken builds are not conducive to a good table. Now if you're going for a broken build and the table has agreed, then it's not broken. Because the objective is to build a character that is going to be overpowered, over the top, and basically god mode. And there are a lot of systems that actually work with that. Slay Industries, RuneQuest, Exalted, just to name a few. They work on broken builds. But if you are planning on building a broken character, I've got to be honest, all you're seeming like to me is the kid that goes to the sap beat just to kick over someone else's sandcastle. You're here to ruin everyone else's time. So, while yes, feats can make a broken character, so can anything else. So can magic items, ASI, weapons, class features, everything you can imagine can build a broken character. But if you are, that's really toxic and you need to look at yourself. Guess we're doing a follow-up. So, the term Power Gamer is used to describe a player who specifically builds their character to be able to do the most damage, to be the most effective, to be the best at what they do, and usually the best at the table, or just be able to do whatever they can at the table and be involved in any situation. Power Gamer is a difficult subject for me, because in my native systems, not Dungeons & Dragons, where I'm talking about Rune Quests, Slay like Industries, or Flesh to be Eaten, and the World of Darkness systems, I guess all players would be considered power gamers? If you just came from Dungeons and Dragons, yeah, you'd just see all of them being able to th do things that don't necessarily are to their class, because those systems don't use a class. All of those systems are built around skills, all players have skills, and a good character will have a couple of skills they do really well, and then have a couple of points in a few other areas 
to be able to assist in situations. And those systems are very easily abused to the point where you can have some really powerful characters with some really intense skills that in D&D would be considered power gamers. So that's where my first crux would be with a power gamer, where it's different to someone who's building a broken character. Because some systems do lean in more to power gaming. B building a powerful character with a lot of skills and a lot of abilities can do a lot of things. But at the end of the day, if your table isn't happy, then you shouldn't be doing it. It's kind of that simple. If you're the only person who's power gamed, and the rest of the table are not having fun watching you succeed at literally everything, then that's where it does become a possible toxic trait, or at least what could become a toxic trait. Again, with power gaming though, I do understand how it works. It's basically treating Dungeons and Dragons as if it were a video game, using a meta to create a overpowered character. Now, when I've always heard about meta, it was in uh, card games. The current meta is towards Gravekeepers, the current uh, meta is towards Black Decks in Magic the Gathering. And there are loads of resources for D&D 5th Edition where it says what the best class, race and feat combinations to create a absurdly powerful character. And usually that's done with rogues and barbarians. So it's exclusively combat, so these power gamers aren't going to be getting much roleplay. I feel like if you have a power gamer who's bringing good roleplay to the table, it's not really a problem. It means you've got a powerhouse on the back bench who is still being involved story-wise. It's when they start trying to play off that they're the main character, that's when it becomes a problem, and that's when it needs to be stopped very early. So although power gaming I don't think is a toxic trait, it can very easily become a toxic trait, and is something that needs to be watched and monitored, and the person needs to be aware of it. Also, I want to see a power gamed cleric, like, be the best healer you can be. I've got a challenge for you, D&D &D TikTok. It's always good to remember where our roots come from, where we base our ideas from and how we've grown as a community. So I challenge every Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition player, and if you've only played Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, better. 3.5? Fantastic. The one game I don't want you to have played? Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. I want you to try and build your character in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition, and then realise why that game is such a dumpster fire that we love. Okay, so it's not really a challenge, it's more just me ranting on Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. Because that's where I started. And I pretty much only a few months ago, literally four months ago, day before Olivia was born, I finished up a two year long Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition campaign. This is a system that has no subclasses. In fact, no, that's wrong. It has Ranger and Paladin that are fighter subclasses, and it has Illusionist, which is a subclass of Wizard. Thief and Assassin are completely different classes, and Bard is a transcended class you can only get by having so many levels in Fighter, Thief, and Druid. Oh, and Druid is a subclass of Cleric, that you have to have so many levels in Cleric to become a Druid, and you lose your Cleric abilities, like wearing medium armor, and have a severely cut down spell list, and don't prepare any restoration or healing spells. Okay, that one might be one from just my party. This is also a system where every class levels at a different rate, where everyone takes a couple levels in Thief because it has some survivability that you need, and on top of that is the fastest level in class, going from level 1 to 2 with 750 experience points. Meanwhile, wizards take 2,500 experience points. EXP is calculated by gold you have earned, not by the enemy that you defeated. Armor class is a scale of 10 being the worst to negative 10 being the best. If you have a constitution uh, of 18, your hit points will go up an additional 2 points, not 4. A system where you are lucky to survive with one character past 2 sessions at most. And the ultimate bane of anyone that played that system, Thacko. And that is an inappropriate pronunciation because it stands for 2 hit armor class 0. That's right, your 2 hit modifier is not a modifier. You work out your dexterity 2 hit or your strength 2 hit or your magic to hit, and then you take the specific weapon or even spells to hit modifier, because every weapon has its own to hit modifier against a specific armor class. For example, great swords get a plus three to hit armor class zero, but a minus two to hit armor class ten, because less armor is better against weapons like that, apparently. And last but not least, fireball. 
does your wizard level in d6 damage, filling a 20,000 volume space, not 20 feet. So, fellow dice goblins of TikTok, I've got a question for you all, so uh, stitch this, yeah? Anyone else's dice suffer from pretty privilege? Like, I've got some really gorgeous sets of dice that I know are rolling bad on purpose. They know I won't imprison them because they're too pretty. Meanwhile, the really fugly ones roll nat 20s every single time. Check out some of these pretty little bitches. Look at how sparkly and pretty. And yet... Okay, so the green ducky has an 8. The pink has a 7. The dandelion has an 8. Sparkly one has a 7. A 5. I hate you two the most. And yet I'm physically incapable of getting rid of them because they're so pretty. Help! And that's just the ones from two characters sets. I've got an entire bag full of really gorgeous traitors in my house. Hey there, D&D TikTok. Dice check. Show me your newest set of dice. Your oldest set of dice. The dice you spent way too much money on. The dice that you only bought because they remind you of a specific character, the dice you grab for important roles, the dice that always screw you over, your most unique set of dice, and the dice you grab for death saving rolls. Ah! Hey there, D&D TikTok! Dice check! Show me your newest set of dice, your oldest set of dice, the dice you spent way too much money on, the dice that you only bought because they remind you of a specific character, the dice you grab for important roles, the dice that always screw you over, your most unique set of dice, and the dice you grab for death saving roles. Ah! Say I'm named five famous people and I'll name five birds. I'll name a hundred birds. Nobody wants your... It's boiling hot. I'm suffering. I'm in my car. Sure, why not? And just as the sun is beating down on me and making me sweat like the biggest sinner in church. My 40 minute TED talk would literally be on how evil deities in Dungeons and Dragons are in fact good, and good deities in Dungeons and Dragons are in fact evil. Major focuses and talking points being on the dead three, if you don't know who those are, those are Bane, Merkel, and Baal. Now it's difficult to make Baal look good, but I have and will do it. Meanwhile, good deities looking evil include Timora, Lythander, Ao, and Helm looked like a goddamn threatening thug. That would be my TED talk. Thank you for coming. And damn you, morning lord, it's so goddamn hot, it's the evening! DMs with TikTok, I have a question for you. So stitch this with your response. What does prep time look like to you? I'll go first. Prep time for me involves me taking up the most amount of space possible at the kitchen table, usually with a drink. It's not usually as healthy as water and squash. And just a stack of all the books in the loop. That's like the base. Of, that's like Dungeon Master's Guide at the top. Monsters Manual is just basic. Then I've got like Van Richten's Monster of the Multiverse. Anything that's got a stat block or a magic item in goes in that pile. And then there's like that's my fin that's my like semi finish notes. That's like maps, like how I'm breaking down uh, dungeons. That's the folder that it'll all go into, which is for the campaign. Paper, lots of paper, and then over here just dice and like player's handbook and Xanathos, like what the players use. So stitch this to what it looks like. In your world, what is the average distance between settlements? Kinda depends on local geographic, current wars, um, different enemies, and monsters that may be causing problems. Bandits can be additional problems, but as a standard rule of thumb. No settlement is more than one day's travel from another settlement, with the exception of if something is in the way. For example, some of the more well-constructed or well-thinking bandit and raider organisations, because a lot of bandits do double up as mercenaries doing banditry work when the mercenary work is slow, have been known to take over smaller settlements and turn it into sort of either an ambush point or turn it into a local base. This in turn turns the travel distance between safe settlements from one day to two days with an absolute threat in the middle. But yeah, standard rule of thumb, no less than one day uh, by horse. Didn't think I'd come here without reinforcements, did you? Wish I'd thought of that. 
Oh wait, I did. New campaign pretty soon. What's your favorite way of handling character attributes? Trashy English weather is appropriate against gorgeous American weather. So what I do at my table is I do what's referred to in the Chaosium system as hero rolling. That's where you roll 4d6 and you choose the three highest numbers. The other aspect of it though is it does include grace rolls. So if you roll ones on your initial roll, you can re-roll them once. If it comes up as one again, you're stuck. And then lastly, what you can then do is you can do effectively a point shuffle of up to five points. That means you can take away up to five points from one or multiple attributes and put up to five more points into another attribute, as long as it doesn't take it over 18. It does create some really powerful characters, but it does mean that my players don't feel like they're ever scrubs even at level one. So I like it. Question, do I have to grow a beard to be a good DM? Not at all. It's installed for free once you reach legendary status. Who needs to hear this? Um, but if you were doing a duet video and it's not one where like you're comparing like accents or something like that, where the other video actually requires for you to be in the video and to talk, um, take yourself out of the video. I don't want to watch somebody on this screen and then you over here being like, just take yourself out. Thanks. What I'm saying is I haven't seen a hot dice goblin look good in a sundress. I'm just saying, you can't prove me wrong. Okay, let's see. Long. Um, oh, elf, okay. Wizard. Oh, what? Wait, this actually works. Okay, yeah. It's weird, but it works. Kind of. Go, go look. Oh, this this yeah. is weird, but it works. Wait a minute, you played this character. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, it's not just Celadine. Uh, Actually, pretty good charisma start. How dare you! <laughs> what would you do if I broke into your house? I apparently made some mistake. Popular D&D opinion. Levels 1 and 2, your characters should have no class. My guy, I agree with you. Now, go and watch the rest of his video for the full explanation of that stitch, but here we go for a story time. My D&D group recently started Icewind Dale. We just finished a two-year campaign where we took them from level 1 in D&D 1st edition all the way to level 20 in D&D 5th edition. So the conversion was insane. They forget what it's like to be a level 1 because it's been that long. We even had a Curse of Strahd campaign that ended at level 11. So they are used to powerhousing characters. Long story short, end of the first session, the Paladin and the Blood Hunter were both on zero hit points, and the end of the second combat, the Wizard was on death saves. Uh, only the Bard so far hasn't been dropped, but that's because she's been smart enough to stay out of combat and not play a blind wizard, Nick! Hey, TikTok, what's your favorite multi-class and why? First off, holy crap, you talk so fast. Second, get out of the way, Paladin. Get out of the way, Hexadin. I don't care. Best multi-class ever, in my opinion. Fighter, Cleric, Multiclass. Six levels in Fighter, everything else in Cleric. There is a new Holy Warrior on the battlefield, bitch. You got Action Surge. You got two attacks. You've got Second Wind, so you can heal yourself. And you really want to up that? Make sure that you take the Banneret subclass for Fighter, because then you're healing on your bonus action. You can action, he attack two per targets with your Flail, or your Mace, or your Sword, and then use your Action Surge, Cure wounds on that guy, and then bonus action, uh, yeah, bonus action, second wind, heal yourself, and heal everyone around you for six points of fighter level. Fighter, cleric, multi-class, when you want to heal and take names harder than anything else. Thank you. And then on top of all those sweet-ass heals, you've got your perfect knight. You've got a character who initially wants to be a knight, the perfect fighter, serve their sovereign lord. Basically, best at the best at what they do, fighter. And then suddenly, they are called to God. Now normally you'd think Paladin. Screw that, because Paladins aren't good fighters. Fighters are good fighters. Boom. I said it. Okay, baby's bottles are made up. Let's see what we get. Uh, gnome? Do you like gnome? But no, <laughs> I'll look cool. With those stats? Oh god, that is a barbarian. Oh my god, the, the, the constitution modifier doesn't even help the dex mod. Oh, 14 strength. No squishy barbarian.
Jenny, I just rolled these stats. Oh dear. It's a no barbarian, 14 strength and 7 dexterity. Help! Okay, d d TikTok. You did me dirty last time. Come on, don't screw with me. Give me something other than a goddamn pebble. Come on, let's do this. Come on, please. Please. Uh, half link, okay, I can cut through it. Uh, I'm not super keen. Oh, yes! Something worthwhile. Thank you. Jenny, I'm not a pebble. Oh, yeah, you can work with that. Yay! <laughs> Yay. Mega stoned halfling. You are being reincarnated into a world where you're going to be a minor deity. What? I am the minor deity of getting shit done. Not at a time that is convenient to other people. Not in a timely manner. Not when it is best for others. I am the minor deity of getting that shit done. Doesn't matter when, doesn't matter where, but it will be done. What people will sacrifice to me is meat, alcohol, and the time that they are using to not do the thing so that they can do the thing to the best of their ability and just get it done. Thank you. DMs of TikTok. Stop and blind react to this right now. Let's see how you'd narrate this scene on the spot. Ready? One of your players rolls a critical success when persuading the orcish innkeeper to tell them about local rumors. How does that innkeeper respond? Ah, thank you very much. It is good to know someone is seeking to help our people in ways the guard may not want to see. I have heard many rumors from the underground of a thieves guild looking to sell on a magical artifact. And see if you can retrieve the Nicely item. Done. Stitch this or use this audio and tell me how you organize your shelves. Do you follow the path of order and everything is organized? Do you focus on aesthetics like color coding the shelves? Or are you a chaos hamster and just throw your books? It's my birthday. What is your character bringing on our picnic? Okay, so I can't go through all my characters, so I'll just go with the one who's most current, uh, Teelan. Um, okay, so Teelan will probably just bring lots of carnival food, because that's all Teelan can actually make, so lots of popcorn, and uh, caramel apples, and... Uh, oh, can I do donuts? Hawkshaw, do we have any animal fat to make donuts, Allah? Elk, deer, or bear? I don't know which one of those is safe. We'll see, uh... I, I might be able to do donuts. Might be able to do donuts. Yeah, donuts be fun. Also, whose baby human is this? <laughs> Exhaustion doesn't add to the gameplay, it just slows things down. So normally I agree with your unpopular opinions, but for once, I actually disagree. In most situations, you are correct. Exhaustion adds nothing to gameplay, it slows everything down, and it's just a ball ache for the players. And it's a ball ache for the GM to plan as well. But I run one specific campaign really well, and it's a style I hold to, and it's a style that I love the most. Survivalism. I love going full Bear grills on a campaign, both as a player and as a games master. And you know what? I have one recommendation, in which case, exhaustion? Actually worthwhile. Icewind Dale handles exhaustion perfectly. All exhaustion is expelled after a short rest, where you have a good meal, fire, and time to rest. None of this long rest rubbish. Just have a decent rest, you're back on your feet. You guys are the heroes, you don't need a spa day. Get out there. Hey, DMs of TikTok, here we go again with another put a finger down challenge. This time I'm going to make sure it's under a minute. <laughs> put a finger down if you utilize your character's backstories in your campaign's narrative. Put a finger down if you've ever used the term, the door's ajar, or there's a fork in the road. The elephant out of the room, put a finger down if you ever said, how do you want to do this? Let's be honest. Put a finger down if you've ever had a TPK. What's that like? Put a finger down if you've ever had your players cry. Put a finger down if your players ever stuck around the Discord after you've left. Alternatively, if they stuck around in a parking lot or around their car even though you already kicked them out of your house. Put a finger down if you've ever commissioned art for your players. Put a finger down if you've ever gotten choked up during dialogue. Finally, put a finger down if you have BBEG dice. If you put five fingers or more down, 
They don't pay you to do this? Huh. Hmm. Tell us a tale about an animal companion or a familiar. Okay, so D&D Wani, my wizard, had a pet warhound that she'd acquired through shenanigans and a weasel familiar. And we decided the weasel would always ride around on the dog's back. So as far as the weasel was concerned, all I'd done was get him a mount. Now, adventures ensue as they do, and we ended up having to run across a snowfield with pit traps full of spiky things in them. Now, all of us have made it, as has the party's wolf. However, my dog has failed the deck save and is now falling. And I'm panicking, freaking out, what am I going to do? I know, I can cast fly. No, I can't. It's a touch spell. What do I do? And then I suddenly remember that my familiar is a casting point and he's touching the dog. Fly is cast, and then for the rest of the campaign, that dog was convinced if it flapped its ears hard enough, it could fly. He also became an... Stitch this. I want to know what your favourite reverse positivity fan theory is. If you don't know what reverse positivity fan theory is, I will of course go first, but let me explain. I like to keep my TikTok mostly positive. There's a couple of bits from real life, obviously when Pearl passed away and the electricity debacle, but I try and avoid drama. I, I don't have time for that, I don't have the energy for that. I have a daughter, I have a wife, I have a house, I have a mortgage, I have shit I need to do. So I'm also not keen on all the negativity that keeps getting thrown around places. People just trying to be offended, people just looking for things to be upset about, people looking for things to stir the pot and drum up views. If you're here for that, you're here for the wrong reason. And it's the same with fan theories. I hate those fan theories that say that Ash Ketchum got electrocuted by Pikachu and has been in a coma for 20 years. Or the Powerpuff Girls are mutated corpses who were brought back because Professor Utonium's uh, daughters died when they were children. Or that him is Professor Newtonium's brother who was a transgender or homosexual or whatever, and basically he killed him because he was doing experiments because he's homophobic. So I want to hear your reverse positivity fan theories. My personal favorite, The Walking Dead. Great series, very dark. The Walking Dead, it's a campaign of All Flesh Must Be Eaten, which is a zombie TTRPG, where you've got a lot of players who are drop in, drop out, it's a big campaign, it's a massive epic, and sometimes players want to come back as bad guys or as zombies themselves. I mean, that's personally one of my favourites. So the idea is, you take a usually very dark, serious, and upsetting series, as I said. Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, Sophie's Choice, the notebook, whatever, it does not matter. And then you make it the positive, cutest, most wholesome thing you can find. I like my wholesome talk, so let's try and ruin some of the dark talk with some wholesomeness. Okay? Hey Game Masters, what do you wish settings would include that they often leave out? Recommended enemies, random encounters, and loot. It's something I feel is really lacking in most tabletop role-playing games. They feel like that's something they should leave to the Games Master to work out because that's based on story and lore, what the BBG is doing. But if you've got a pre-built setting and a pre-built world, it would be nice to get some flavour using what kind of enemies the players are most likely to encounter. What kind of random encounters are the players most likely to encounter? What loot might be on those enemies as a standard expectation? Like, if you're in a cyberpunk game, are you more likely to find a police officer? Is the police officer likely to be friendly, willing to take a bribe? What's the vibe that this place gives through its inhabitants and objects? So, yeah, that's what I'd like to encounter.